once I've picked up the truck, I did that drive nearly all the way to Utah and back. The reason we didn't actually go to Utah is covered in this video. And then I've driven this as a daily driver, which is where the 2,661.9 miles that are currently on the odometer have come from. Now, I've used this to go and pick up straw for my chickens, feed for my chickens, to go and do the regular weekly shop, and also to carry a load of camera gear. When Michael and I had to make a trip recently to New York, we put all of the camera gear in the back of the truck and we just hauled it to the airport and it was so easy and barely an inconvenience. One of the things I've really enjoyed about my time owning this truck thus far is how reliable it has been. Granted, there was a little bit of a bug on that very first week of ownership where Blue Cruise decided it wasn't going to work and I had to disconnect the 12 volt battery to reboot the system. That has since not returned. The truck has been very, very well behaved. And while we did go to the dealership, to get a few things carried out as remedial work, nothing was major. The dealership wanted us to have the software update that Ford had pushed to solve the tire pressure monitoring system error, which resulted in the TPMS system not notifying people when the tire pressure was too low. That's now been fixed and they did a whole host of other things, mainly tightening up a few things that were loose, such as the sun visor on the passenger side, and also ordering a bunch of things for the frunk area. One of the struts on the hood was, the outer sheath was cracked, so they've ordered a replacement one of those. They've ordered a replacement battery tray cover because that came from the factory with a missing part. And they've also fixed the luggage hooks that were a bit loose and rattly in the frunk. I've been averaging between 2.2 and 2.8 miles per kilowatt hour on rural roads. That does drop quite precipitously on the freeway, especially if I am driving very, very quickly. But since I've added that rear tonneau cover, things have actually improved in terms of efficiency. Before the tonneau cover was installed, I was seeing between 2 and 2.4 miles per kilowatt hour. Now I'm seeing between 2.3 and 2.8 miles per kilowatt hour. At the back of the truck, we've made two very important modifications. The first one is to install this bed rug. Now this is the bed rug impact liner. It is from bed rug. Instead of having the carpeted material on the floor, it has this very hard wearing, tough, rubberized internal section here. It's nicely padded. It's great for putting things in. And of course, we are using this to store camera gear when we're on the road, when we're heading to the airport. And so being able to put our flight cases on here, they're not gonna scratch up the bed of the truck. It's also going to provide a little bit more friction than just the painted surface. And it's going really nicely so far. This has been in for about a month. We had a couple of install glitches, one of them around the lights here. You'll see that there is a bit of a faux pas, a mess up. Uh, that one is totally down to myself and my partner. We were installing it and we didn't quite cut things out properly. But as you can see, we've removed all of the furniture in the bed of the truck and we've been able to unscrew everything. We've been able to put the bed rug in and then put the screws back in. In order to do the install properly, we did have to remove the tail lights. That process is very easy. There's actually only two bolts that hold each tail light on, one here and one here. You remove those and then the tail light kind of comes out at an angle. That allows you to gain access to the electronics for this so you can install it properly. Uh, we did, as I said, we did screw up where we cut the holes, but otherwise that would have been done very nicely. Also came free with our truck, these great tie downs, which is part of Ford's official kind of uh, system for, for holding loads. And to top it off, we have a Retrax power cover, a tonneau cover. Now there is a slight issue with this. It is fully power operated. It's an aluminium cover, which is great. And it's very solid. It's 
supposedly able to support like 250 pounds. I'm not going to test that out, but it does provide full security. You cannot push it all the way open. There is a little bit of leeway. We did have an issue with the install. Now, I think there is something broken. If you come around here, Michael, we'll show everybody. Just here on the top of the bed, there is an issue on this side. We think something may have gone wrong inside here. We are in the process of talking to Retrax about getting that fixed. But other than that, the Retrax XR Pro has been absolutely great. You'll also notice we've got rails here, so we can install effectively a roof rack system on top of that if we need to carry extra stuff on the road. Now, this works really nicely. This is essentially just a garage door opener, and you can actually set your garage door home link set up inside the truck to operate this. So I don't have to clamor for the key fob when I'm driving, I just have to press the same buttons that you would normally assign to a garage door opener or a gate opener. Now, in order to close it, because this is not properly working yet, I'm gonna open it a little bit. Then I'm gonna put the step down, like so. And then, of course, I can either lift it or I can use my remote. This will then close properly. And then, just hit this button and it's all nicely closed. Now we've used this to keep our camera gear safe on the road already. We do need to talk to Retrax and make sure that we can get that warranty repair done. I don't know if we installed it incorrectly or if it was just broken from the factory, but it's just really a cosmetic thing. And the big issue is no one can get in there and steal your stuff, but it will let rain in. There are drain plugs, but of course you wanna try and keep the inside of the bed as dry as absolutely possible. I do want to talk very briefly about my experience with the ceramic coating. This truck was not cheap, it was a couple of grand, but I'm so glad we did it. And I am a total convert now to ceramic coating. And the reason is that out here in rural Oregon, there is a lot of dust in the summer. You've got machinery in the fields, doing harvesting work, you've got lots of gravel trails, and dust gets thrown up everywhere. And while my truck is currently covered in a layer of pretty thick crud, all I have to do to clean it off is to rinse it off with tap water, and then use a special cleaning solution, which is less harmful to the environment than your normal automotive shampoo. You just put that on with a clean wash mitt, and then you are just going to dry it off with a regular soft towel. Bugs come off a lot more easily because of the ceramic coating. The paint shine returns every time you wash it, and it seems to last longer in between washes before the truck starts to look really icky and horrible, so I can't complain. There is one very nasty bug with this, and it really is the only thing that really irks me, and that is it's all too easy to accidentally set the temperature of the air conditioner to very hot, just by accidentally brushing your finger against one of these. It, I've done it multiple times now, and the truck will automatically turn on the heated seats, and it will turn the heater on, and if it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit plus outside, you really don't want that to happen. So I hope Ford fixes that. I'm not entirely sure whether I'm brushing against the touchscreen or whether I'm hitting the max heating button that is just below the screen here. But what I can tell you is that Ford has sent a system update to this truck. It's the first system update that we've ever had. It was rolled out yesterday. I went to go and pick up some coffee beans and when I got back in the truck, it was like, oh hey, you've got a Ford power up and we've already automatically applied the update and it's good to go, which is great. And Ford has this kind of double memory slot thing going on with the update. So unlike a lot of cars where you have to have the car parked up, it downloads the update and you have to manually apply it with both the Mark E and the F-150 Lightning and I presume the e-transit 
it downloads the new system software in the background, whether you're driving along, whether you're stationary, and then the next time you turn your vehicle on, if that update has finished downloading, it just automatically applies it. This is good for two reasons. One, it means if the system update balks and goes wrong, you can always revert to the previous version. And two, you're not stuck around waiting for your vehicle to update. So I really like that. What I do not like though, is Ford's really stupid, sucky revision notes. Small changes here and there, ongoing updates like this help you enjoy the best possible version of your F-150 Lightning truck, enjoy. That is about as useless as a chocolate teapot there, Ford. I would really like some more information as to what is included in the update. I haven't noticed any changes. I've been looking online and nobody seems to be able to tell me. Interestingly though, I do not think it's just the tire pressure monitoring system. Some people have said it's the tire pressure monitoring system bug and we're fixing it. But as far as I am aware, when I took Adir et al to the Ford dealership for them to just look at some niggles that I had about the truck when it was brand new, like the scratch on the, the B pillar and tightening up the sun visors and a couple of other things. They said, oh, we want to apply the software update now. And I'm like, well, I could just wait for the over the air. It's not like a, a make or break update. And they're like, no, no, we'll do it now. So whether they didn't do it and then it just applied over the air or whether there's something else in this power up update, I don't know, but it's good to see that it's actually working and you can turn on automatic updates, just select that, or you can schedule updates, which I really like. You can say what days of the week you want the updates to occur. The only other modification I've got to do is I'm going to replace the whip antenna on the front passenger side wing with a tiny stubby 1.5 inch one because the antenna on there is a whip antenna and it flaps around like crazy when you're driving at anything above like 30, 40 miles an hour. Then we'll put the whip antenna under the rear seat in the storage compartment there. If we happen to be somewhere where there's a natural disaster, like a forest fire or heavy snow, sometimes you'll see signs at the side of the road in America that says tune to, and it'll give you an AM frequency to tune to. So we're gonna keep that whip antenna in the truck. So if we do need to listen to a particular AM station in an emergency, we can just take the stubby antenna off, put the whip antenna back on and regain all of our reception. But for round town, round Portland, the little tiny stub antenna should be just fine. I can't give you a truck update without discussing the Charge Station Pro, which is what this is. It's Ford's dedicated charging station designed for the F-150 Lightning. And what makes it different is the fact that unlike most AC chargers, which have just a J1772 connector on them, this actually has a combo plug. The reason for that is that the combo plug is used to pull DC power out of the truck to use with your home integration system if you have one fitted and the AC charging system is only used, the top bit is only used to charge the truck. So you cannot use CCS to charge the truck at home. It only pulls power out of the truck to your home integration system. The home integration system is about 3,700 US dollars. You then have to pay to have it installed to so put another couple of grand on top of that to have it installed. I do not have one yet, but if you purchased an extended range Ford F-150 Lightning, I think you should have gotten one of these Charge Station Pros included with the truck. Maybe not for the Pro extended range, but for all the other models with extended range, you got the Charge Station Pro they are technically capable of providing up to 80 amps of AC charging power to your truck, which is very important because the extended range F-150 Lightnings have two chargers on board, so they can charge at up to 20 kilowatts or thereabouts from a compatible AC charging station. That's the same kind of power as you will see from one of Tesla's high-end home charging stations. The problem is there have been many, many reports of these units overheating and failing to charge customers' trucks, even if the customer's home electrical systems are properly wired and everything is set up correctly. Now you can derate this station if your home does not have a spare 100 amp breaker, which is what you would need to provide 80 amps because you have to have a little bit of overhead when you're setting up your breaker. If your home is not capable of reaching that, you can actually detune the charging station so it will only provide a lower power level to the truck. But if you have 
100 amps spare on your breaker panel and you install a 100 amp breaker and you let this charge at a full 80 amps in the summer weather we've been hearing of these units just timing out erroring charging for a bit and then overheating ford has not publicly responded to this but it does make me kind of wonder if i should put this in or if i should just give it up my first impressions i've not really unboxed it is that this is a very lightweight unit and it's an all plastic construction which doesn't feel like it's going to be very good at handling all of the heat dissipation i like the nice logo here there is an led here that gives you a different status indicator it's a multiple color leds in there and it can shine different lights depending on what's going on that is it for today's video if you like this video make sure that you give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends